to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. Yeah, we have- so hopefully that came out good. <laughs> it was great. It was perfect. Perfect. Everything. Just the fitness industry. I mean, you're a badass. I think he just called me old. I think he just called me old. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not All right, guys, welcome back to another episode on the Dynamic Lifestyle Podcast. We have the amazing Rita Catolino in the house mm-hmm. with us. How are you doing, Rita? I lo- that was just a great pronunciation. I'm just honored you pronounced my last name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, before I hit the record button, I wanted to make sure, and I said, I want to say it the Italian way, so hopefully that came out good. <laughs> it was great. It was perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the show. And uh, I'm excited about this just because we have a lot of history from the past and uh, you have so much experience and so much wisdom just as an entrepreneur, just coach everything, just the fitness industry. I mean, you're a badass. I think he just called me old. I think he just called me old. <laughs> no, not, not at all. No, not. I think you're just barely probably just scratching the surface. And Chris and I, we're, we're 10 years in and I always say, I feel old when I say that. Yeah. For sure. When you say a decade, when you put that yeah. decade behind you in the fitness industry, especially if you're in an online space like we are, it's 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 a good accolade. It's a good it's good to say it. Yeah, absolutely. It is. But then Chris makes a joke and says, oh, like he, he calls us old or something. <laughs> you guys are babies. You're babies. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, Rita. So let's kick this off. And uh, Chris and I, with our show here, we do things a little bit different, a little bit just out of the ordinary. So um, I'm going to give you a couple choices. Um, so I want yeah. the listeners to get a little bit of just like an idea of who you are and just pl- have some fun with this. So we can either play this game. It's called Never Have I Ever, <laughs> or we could do rapid dynamic questions. So I'm going to leave it up to you on what you want to do. Oh God, I played Never Have You Ever and it's not, um, I had a couple, <laughs> okay. I had a couple of tequila in me and, and it was, it was, I don't know if it's, is this G rated? Okay. So maybe we should do the other rapid dynamic questions. Okay. We can roll with that. So you want to roll dynamic, uh, the rapid dy- dynamic questions? Yeah. Halfway through, I might be able, I might change my mind, but sure. <laughs> let's do it. No, and we just love giving the choice. So let's, let's start off. So let's say Rita, you had a, you're, you're Canadian. So let's say, um, like, you know, the, the governor or, um, wherever you live just was like, Rita, I want to grant you with a huge billboard just in like your area. What would that billboard say and why? Oh, oh that is a good question. Um, Jump off a cliff and build your plane on the way down. Oh, okay, I like yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. I just, you know, especially being in an, being in the entrepreneurial space, I find so many people ask me like, "How did you get started?" And with the new generation, they just want everything perfect. They want all their ducks in a row before they even, you know, press launch. Mm. And I've found in my own expertise or wisdom or age or whatever you want to call it that everything that has happened to me in every bit of success has come through just going with that passion and then putting all those building blocks in place as you go and as you learn and as you make your mistakes, you know, instead of waiting for the perfect logo and the perfect website and the perfect timing and the perfect, perfect algorithm, you know, you'll never press start if you're waiting for everything to be perfect before you even begin. I could just say right now, just you, that mic's on fire. You could pour water on <laughs> Oh, 100% agree though. Mic drop. <laughs> that was good. Okay. So next question is, what's the biggest silver lining that came out of the whole entire like pandemic this past year for you? Oh, I've had lots, but you know, time with family for sure. We travel like crazy, um, pleasure and business, but even if it is for pleasure, there's always that like downtime and prepare time and come home time. And I never felt like I was just in one spot at the same time to just delve into a lot of the projects that have now come to fruition because of the pandemic, like my podcast that I just launched, I'm writing a book and just a lot of things that are conducive to staying home with less distraction. So, and the second thing would be less distraction. I'm a human being. I'm a woman. I like shopping when the mall's open and I'm kind of bored. I'll go to the mall, you know, like that, that stuff that happens and not having those, like we're in a pure lockdown over here where I am in Ontario. And I mean, nothing is open and it hasn't been for a long time. And I don't think it it will be for the next month, which is really 
great for doing things that I, I'm not distracted. I'm not distracted. All distractions are equal as they say. So even if it's quote unquote positive, it's just my, my choices to, to put my blinders on and really dig into these projects that have been in, in my heart and on my head for so long, but I've just been distracted. Um, and then and the, the other thing is really figuring out what you need and what you want in life and mm -hmm. who you, who you need and who you want in your life. Right. Absolutely. I feel like as a social butterfly, I was like, yeah, I'll go to that event. I'll go to that networking event. I'll let that person in my life. I'll spend two hours of my day having a coffee with this person and just being home and, and being able to navigate things without the noise. You're like, I'm, I'm okay if I don't do that coffee again. And I'll make the decision when we open back up again, whether I want to spend two hours with that person or with my two-year-old son, right? So definitely those are a few of the silver linings. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Finish the sentence, the world needs more of. More of you guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was, that was just a little, the world I needs more, <clears throat> the world needs more empathy. Mm -hmm. How come though? Empathy is that word that gets thrown around a lot. Like, oh, I feel you, you know, or something like that. But em empathy is truly being open to listening to other people and, and feeling other people, even if it means changing your own mind or your own mindset. And I think that's something that especially the younger generation may struggle with. It's like it's my way or the highway or, or once you pertain to a set of ideals or or ideations you're like oh i've said it i can't go back mm -hmm. right whereas that closed-mindedness will never allow for empathy and being able to feel right now for so many people in the world who are you know i'm not affected financially by the pandemic on the contrary and either is my husband but that doesn't mean i can't sit here and go wow you know this is affecting people on so many levels mm -hmm. and you know i can't imagine having to having my restaurant closed for the 10th time in a row which yeah. is my my way of bringing home food for my family like sometimes i cry at night even though it hasn't affected me on that level because i feel for all of those people that's empathy and if we had more empathetic people that i think we would all have better conversations and less cancel culture unless you suck you're out you know there's there's where's the empathy in that oh uh, gosh 100% wow yeah so what what's the biggest worry these days for me or for our for you our, yeah our world for you oh. just personally or <clears throat> um god i'm not a worrier i mean my worries are very kind of superficial like um, if my daughter doesn't come home on time it, where is she or did somebody abduct her like stupid like paranoia things i'm, I'm not a worrier i i use my energy on on things that i can control and and i and, and, I, and not on the things I can't control. So there is a little bit of frustration and worry and where we're going in terms of our world and, right. you know, mm -hmm. being told, you know, do this. Okay, we do this and then do that and we do that. And then where's the end? You know, I, I'm feeling like, and I'm over here in Canada. I don't know if it's quite, ex I don't think we're quite as extreme as you guys, but, you know, it's feeling less and less like, like, it's feel more and more like communism. <laughs> and I know that sounds like I'm going Seriously, kind yeah. of extreme right here. And we can, where's this going to end? You know, like you're not allowed to have your family in your house over here. And that just seems, and people are getting fined for having their mom and dad over. And if you said that to somebody two years ago, they would say that would never happen. Yeah. But what's, and, and what's the next step? We've, it's only been, you know, 10 months of this. And if the next step is you can't be with your children, and you can't do this. And like, I, those are my kind of worries and fears, like being separated from family, or if I have to go on a business trip and then they close my borders and don't let me back in and my family's mm -hmm. in Canada. Like these are the kinds of things that I would have never worried about in the past, but those are worrisome as we move forward and not being able to, my sister lives in Italy. My nieces live in Italy. And just thinking about not being able to see them this summer is, is scary. 
Yeah. And that, that's what we were talking about kind of like off record, right? was just like why we moved from California to over here to Dallas, because at least it's open, right? And there's a little bit of freedom, you know, because like the joke over there is uh, California is becoming like California, right? Like a oh, communist. Is so that what they're saying? Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I wasn't far off. You know what I mean? So you were far off. So I, I can totally like, you know, relate with that. And I, that's one of my worries as well, too, you know? And you guys have, you guys are, what's your background? You guys have some... Latino. Latino, right? Yeah. So you have, like, are you able to go back home or is that not something that's on the plate? Or? We, could, we could go back. Like, we're even planning a trip to go uh, to Cancun um, in nice. April. But the whole type of thing is, like, I think you have to get, like, a rapid test right when you come back into the States. You know what I right. mean? So right. I don't know. Who knows? And who knows what they're going to put in by April? You know, so that's right. the thing. We just don't know. Yeah. It's yeah. frustrating. Interesting yeah. times. But okay, mm -hmm. Rita, you are off the hot seat with the rapid dynamic question since oh, you good. out of uh, not playing the <laughs> never like, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so Rita, uh, honestly, I, I, I commend you. I, you have so much right now like that I could talk about, but you are a mom. Okay. Mama too. You are a wife. You're an entrepreneur. You're a coach. You're, you just started a podcast. You're going to be an author going uh, forward pretty soon, which is awesome. So how, number one, I want to know where all this drive comes from in the upbringing and then just how do you balance this all out yeah well my drive and determination definitely comes from mom and dad mm. um you know my dad was an immigrant he came to canada when he was 18 years old from italy with a suitcase and one pair of underwear he tells me all the time and he got a job at ford motor company when he was 18 years old and he worked there until he retired you know 37 years later he never missed a day of work they gave him a little gift certificate to the keg, which is like a steakhouse over here every year. And, you know, it wasn't about that gift certificate. It was about this honor that he never missed a day, no matter what, right? Like never missed a day. And, you know, subconsciously as children and me now raising my own two children, it's not about what our parents say to us. It's about what they do every single day that makes the impact on us. So for me, and everything is in retrospect. So you guys asking me that question as a 41 year old woman, I can answer that way. Growing up, I didn't know. I just, you know, that my dad did what he did, but you know, every five or six years we would move from the apartment on the outskirts to the next you know, the better neighborhood with the smallest house in the neighborhood, then the next, then the next. And, you know, my parents now live in the best neighborhood in, in our city. Mm -hmm. And for somebody to, um, without a lick of English, without any from his parents, you know, when his dad got mad, he broke a plate over my Nona's head. Like he had no type of of example, he had no, nobody to show him the drive and determination, but it came from within him. And for him to get as far as he did, for me, it was like, okay, if he could do that with nothing, I who have been given everything on a silver platter, being born in the house I was born with the circumstances in the country I was born with everything, how can I do less than him? Like, he's like my filter of life, right? Like if he could do everything he did with so little, how can I not do way more so, so much, right? Yeah. I would think it would be a waste if I didn't. It would be like a letdown to him. If he had come to Canada to start a family and give them everything he could and sacrifice so much, who am I to, to step on his sacrifice and say, ah, oh, I'm just going to get by life, right? Like that's not a choice for me. My, you know, I need to show up every day and like, if, if life is a sponge, I mean, I have to squeeze every single drop of water out of that sponge. Yeah. Sometimes I think I'm not doing half as much as I should be doing. Like we all have those days, like, oh my God, I just wasted a day. I wasted a week. And then there's times where I'm like, wow, I've done pretty good. And I give myself a pat on the back. And I think the reality lies somewhere in the middle. Yeah. And that's huge. I just, I'd love how you just, that you just explain that to where it's like, if your father came here with nothing and you said you were given everything and just like, right. We're just, we're very just like gifted and, and just everything just brought into this world with opportunity and just, just the way you reframed your mindset is just powerful. And I think if the listeners just really just like listen to that and just apply that, I mean, that's a game changer. Yeah. Thank you. And I do feel that this, you know, and I hate saying this new generation that makes me feel old again, but there's this like, <laughs> And there's this instant gratification and there's this, if I don't get it on the first mm -hmm. try, well, then I'm not going to even try harder. And I've been in the fitness and in, in, I've been in this industry, however you want to name it, health and wellness, fitness for 14 years. Right. And I did 
you know, I did so much pro bono and I know you asked me about the balance and I'll go back to that. I did so much free work just to get my name out there. And if you ask somebody now for like, who wants to, you know, any students out there who want to help me with my website, any students out there who want to, you know, do some editing on my podcast, they won't do it for free. I'm like, man, if somebody like me asked me to do, you know, all it free. And it was, it's not for free. It wasn't gratuitous. It helped me build my brand and my business and my name, but it's just such a different mindset. And I I wish people had that, that work and drive and, and people still do. There's still people, I'm not saying they don't, but of our father's generations and their father's generations, and they were never handed anything. And I think that's such a admirable thing. Um, and I, I think just really quick to touch on, I think it's like what you said, um, you know, there, there's no honor behind it, you know, and I really believe that honor breeds honor. And that's what we're dealing with right now in society. Just like, there's no honor behind worth at work ethic, or if like someone tries something, they give up so quick. A hundred percent. There's yeah. so many roadblocks. And, and when you ask me about balance, <laughs> balance doesn't look like, I think some people are like, okay, I wake up at this time and this and this and this, my balance I, I, is different. There'll be like weeks where I don't come to the, com- not weeks. I don't come to the computer. I don't do any creative work, I'm not writing. And I'm like with my kids a hundred percent. And then, you know, I'm writing a book right now, as you talked about before, and I had to hand in like this big chapter and with writing, it's not like, and I know you guys know, it's not just like, okay, I'm going to carve out an hour a day at this time. I'm not, I might not be feeling it. Right. So the other day it was a Sunday, which is typically my family day. I took everybody out of our house, sent them to my parents. And I sat here for six hours because I was like on fire. My fingers were like, boom, 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 boom. So then there's days where I'm on the phone till midnight doing Zooms, different time zones. And then there's four days in a row where I don't come to the computer. So it's not that the balance looks like this perfectly scheduled thing. It's just like you listen to your body and your mind and you know, like, you know, oh my goodness, I need to give a little bit more attention to my husband. Maybe we need a night alone. Oh, or I need to give a little more attention to my children. It's like you, you have this feeling and you listen to your body and, and, and you make that work. That's how it works for me. I know it works different for everyone. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that though. Cause like our pastor said too, like he was talking about balance and he said, there's no such thing as balance, right? Because if it was like balance, it was a perfect day. It would be like, okay, we wake up at eight and we'd have four hours of work, four hours of family, like, you know, all this stuff would be so balanced, but I like how you broke it down to where it's just like, you're in these waves, you're in like these modes. And um, so you just kind of know when to get stuff done. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if this is totally off topic, but a mentor of mine once told me this was years ago when I was in competing and bodybuilding in all I did was like eat, sleep, eat, sleep, gym, eat, sleep, gym, eat, sleep, gym. And, and it became very robotic. And I noticed I lost a lot of the facets of the kind of crazy Italian emotional woman that I am because I just kind of became this robot. And she made me do this thing every day. She said, leave a blank piece of paper on your desk every day before you go to bed. And when you wake up in the morning, I want you to to, it looked like a cross like this. Mm-hmm. And she goes, those represent four rooms. One is an emotional room. One is a physical room. One is a mental room. And one was your uh, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and spiritual room. Gotcha. <laughs> I was going to say religious, but it was spiritual, right? So she said, you need to make sure that every day you're entering each of those rooms. And your goal is to give each one of those rooms the same amount of of time and, and dedication. And I noticed at the beginning, it was like my physical room was full, like within the first two hours of my day, because I worked out, I went for walks, I went for runs, I cleaned the house, like it, physical for me, allowed me to be so busy that I didn't have to listen to what was going on inside my head, right. And I noticed as I did this practice, week after week after week, and then now I do it innately, like it's just like a, it's like this kind of like the way I eat, I used to count macros, now I balance everything out of my head. But it's almost like, did you even talk to God today? Did you even stop? Did you look outside? And did you realize how beautiful that snowfall was? And that snowflake? Did you sit in stillness? Did you look at the awe and wonderment of the world? And and, and, and now sometimes my days go the opposite, where it's like, two o'clock in the afternoon, it's like physical room is empty, you got to get to the basement, get a workout in right with the pandemic, everything being closed. So it's this, that's a really cool way if people are listening, like to, to figure out their own balancing act, it's like, it might not look perfect, but maybe just writing those four rooms down saying, how many times do I visit each one of those rooms every day? 
Yeah, I love that. I love the whole like just like metaphor of just those four rooms. That's really cool. So what would you say just like based off of just like 14 years of experience? I mean, everything that you've kind of like accomplished and what you're going to accomplish going forward, you know, what would be the best piece of advice to an aspiring like female entrepreneur? (laughs) So much, so much. One piece of advice, you know, number one, go with that thing that you know Go with that thing that's calling you every single day, right? And don't talk yourself out of it because of an over, oversaturated marketplace or because somebody, somebody told you you're not good enough or because three other people just launched the same thing that week or because your Instagram doesn't have as many followers or because you have to scar- whatever it is, it's that thing that's calling on you. That's the thing that you should be doing, right? The thing that keeps coming up over and over and over again. And it kind of goes back to the first thing we talked about in terms of like jumping, uh, jumping off the cliff and building your plane on the way down. Don't worry too much about all the like perfect details and things like that. Just go with the passion and, you know, you might have to hire those other pieces. Along the way. Like you, you may not have, know how to create a website. You may not know how to post on social media, you know, hire the people, hire the coaches, hire those things to implement but if you have to be the passion and drive force behind that thing that's calling on you, you know, I also don't believe that every, everybody should be an entrepreneur. Let me just yeah. say that off the get go. And agree. I know that that's, yeah. you know, I don't think everybody was meant to do that. I'm going to use my father as an example. I feel like he's the only person I talk about, but um, my father is an example. He is that type of person who needs somebody to tell him what to do, when to do it, how to do it, clock in, clock out. And he, he, it's not that he doesn't think for himself. He just, it, it doesn't work. For, it just doesn't work that way. You know what I mean? Whereas you tell me, I don't know how I can count the amount of jobs I had. And I started working when I was 11 years old because my parents were very like, you want to, you want to, you want a nice shirt? You want a nice pair of shoes? You need to pay for it. So I started working at 11 years old and that ended really quickly. I think I've had five jobs where I had to actually like listen to somebody like, no, 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 no. I don't, I, I'm not hiring material. I'm not a hireable person because I have way too many thoughts of my own. But anyway, uh, that came in, but yeah. I think I answered your question. In the- yeah. I know. I know. I know what you're thinking. You're probably like, dude, come on. I was literally watching this video, watching this interview and you literally just pop up on the screen and interrupt it. Trust me, there's a good reason for this. Just hold on, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you get back to that interview or that video. Trust me, all right. So the reason why I stopped you on this is because we're giving away our book a hundred percent free. Okay, so if you're a frustrated fitness professional, you're not growing fast enough, you're looking to future proof and recession proof your business by adding online training, or if you're doing online training, you want to scale and go and grow faster, all you have to do is check out our new book. We're giving the audio away, we're giving the PDF um, away. So all you have to do is click the link below in the description box and get your free copy. All right, so now back to the video. No, that's great. I'm glad that you uh, touched on just not everybody is kind of mm-hmm. wired to be an entrepreneur because it's the flat out truth. You know what I mean? I think that everybody should try it just to kind of just get their feet wet and see if they like it. But I just don't think a lot of people are just like panning out for it. You know, like you said, it's it's a cool picture that people paint on Instagram and social media that like, oh, it's a laptop lifestyle. And it's like, oh, work your own hours. And they don't understand how much freaking work, you know, comes along with that territory. So I, I appreciate that you mentioned that. Yeah, thank you. And if we were all entrepreneurs, we wouldn't have those other people to do the things that entrepreneurs need. <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. That's why it's like important to building building an A team and just understanding kind of like, you know, your strengths and weaknesses. Um, so Rita, like on this show, we like talking a lot about just like uh, perseverance and re- resilience. And um, it's, a, it's a really big thing. So when was the last time you persevered in your life? And um, if you're open to it, you know, I want to ask, you know, respect, respectfully, uh, respectfully first, are you open to talking about about your battle with uh, melanoma. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. I'm an open I'm an open book. Awesome. Appreciate that. Well, that's that's my latest. I have two good stories of per- perseverance. One is older in my life like a, a way back and then the other one is my current battle with melanoma and also I, I I got a lot. I got a lot. I've lived a lot in my 41 years, but one is one, the one that top one that comes to mind is, is nine years of infertility, you know, and, and mm. that's, <laughs> I have a two year old now to show how, how much I did persevere, but I, I, I'm talking to you guys right here, but I'm, I'm an open book and I hope you guys, but when I was in, when I was competing and got really strict and seven years of my life went to shows, I did 
shows in seven years. I represented Canada at the Arnold's. I went to Europe to represent Canada. Like I was like show after show after show, competing, competing, competing. And I lost my menstruation. And yeah. it was normal for an athlete. They call it the athlete triad syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, however, mine never came back. So it was nine years. And my doctors all told me it was early onset menopause. I'll never get it back. I lost it in my late 20s. And at that time when I lost, it was like, cool, I don't have to deal with that monthly crap anymore. It's fine. I'm competing. I don't want any other children was my mindset at the time. But about two or three years in, when my husband and I discussed having children again, that's when it became an issue uh, because you can't get pregnant if you're not menstruating. Right. So, um, so that was about, it was a nine year journey of not menstruating, about seven year journey of wanting children again. And we went through everything. We visited doctors. I just, dis we discussed IVF, we discussed adoption and nobody knows but me, like this, the struggles I went through. And I think I blame myself the whole time because I, I told myself I got myself in that position. So the only way that that happened to me is because of my extreme, you know, obsession with bodybuilding. And so it was this blame game, right? And then it made me feel like, oh, I do have a daughter. I'm ungrateful for the daughter I have if I want this other thing so bad, right? So Lots of mind games, lots of this, but at the same time, I was like, I need to, I need to keep going. Like I, I can't give up. I can't give up. So I went to every doctor on the face of this earth. I did integrative medicine. I did, I did everything. I did chakra healing. I did, I stopped bodybuilding and you have to understand for seven years of my life. Yeah. And I was on the cover of seven magazines. My sole identity was Rita fitness model. I didn't know any other Rita, right? So for me to give up bodybuilding, and put on 10 pounds and never lift a weight for a year just to maybe perhaps get pregnant. It was a huge, you know, lottery. It was like, okay, I'm leaving all of this. Who I am was the way I made my money, the way I identified myself to potentially maybe get, have a period, potentially maybe get pregnant, potentially. But it was like, no, I got to do this. I got to do this. So I did it. I did, I did it all. I listened to my, I worked so much on my insides and left my outsides, which I had only done for so long that, um, you know, story short, eventually got back after the doctor said I never would. And then we got pregnant on our own, which the doctor said we never would. And now I have a two year old son who's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And along the journey, obviously, I've become such a different person. And now I can use like, the fitness and I can use the mindset and I can use the spiritual work I've done. I can use it all and now become this multifaceted human being. And, and it's, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Love yeah. that. No, thanks for sharing that story too. Cause I know that there's a lot of fitness enthusiasts and, and, and uh, fitness professionals listening to this that have probably done comp um, competing or thinking about doing it. And, you know, Chris and I used to coach, you know, athletes doing that as well too. So we're very familiar with that world of just losing uh, women, losing their menstrual cycles. So, I mean, geez, you know, that's awesome though, that you were able to push through that and you guys were able to have your son and um, look now you're, you're super mom. Yeah. And I was going to yeah. ask Rita too, like you said, you did a lot of like work in the, in the inner world. Yeah. Right. And so I know that a lot of listeners are kind we're going to be like thinking, hmm, so I'm going through something like this. Like what kind of like exact inner work did she do? I don't know if you mind just sharing maybe a couple of things like that you did that really helped you like get past some of that stuff. Well, like when I was competing and bodybuilding, it was like robotic. It was like, I have to do leg day today. I wake up, I do legs, even if I don't want to. And I just go, go, go. And you're like a robot through a prescribed, you know, set period of time. So I would start waking up and I would say, what do you need today? I would ask my body, what do you need? today and sometimes it was a walk sometimes it was nothing sometimes it was staying in my pajamas all day sometimes it was whatever that was um and so i started listening to my body bring her as a as a as its entity right and, and that for me was huge i started stopping i started being more grateful and i know that you know gratitude and all that is really cliche but i i, I actually did it i think a lot of people say i'm grateful but they don't really do it mm -hmm. and some days it was harder than others to look around me and say what am i grateful for even though i have a roof over my help my help all i could focus on was i don't have my period i'm not having another baby why did god do this to me you know all the negatives you can do that or you can say look at that tree outside of my house how beautiful is that tree how did it get like you had to it, it it was challenging but that that helped me so much and then i found a lot of practitioners in my city who were into chakra healing and you know i did craniosacral massage and i did all these things to kind of un like if you think of a coil like so tightly like 
wound up, that was my body. My physical body was so like this that I needed people to help let it unwind, right? And like bring my shoulders down. So I saw every type. I saw a Chinese traditional medicine person who did acupuncture on me. And all of these things made me slow down, right? And I think slowing down for me was the big thing. Stop to smell the roses, being okay with not having an agenda that was like, one, 105, two, 205, three, like every slot was filled and being okay with, and there's a saying we have in Italy, which is il dolce di far niente, which means the beauty in doing nothing. Mm. And we've lost that as a society. We, oh, yeah. we, yep. we praise productivity. You know, it's such a North American thing to do too. It's like, what do you do? Like, they don't ask you know, you don't go to Italy. Nobody asks me what I do. They're like, oh, and they talk about the weather and the food and the, like the joys of life. And I started to retake that on again, travel again, being okay with not being too busy. All of these things helped me really, I would say, bring, bring back my, my homeostasis in my body, right? It was so, my cortisol levels were messed up. Everything was go, 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 go. And I, realize I'm more of a like a, um, like male like I have more male in my body than female in terms of like er, aggression and go and assertiveness that I needed to really tap into my feminine side and, and just kind of like be okay with smelling the roses yeah <laughs> absolutely no and I just I, I love how you just said that about just like you know not doing anything and just like being okay with that just uh, grounding yourself and I just think that that's a huge one that we all struggle with including myself um it's tough. It really is. There's like so much like pressure for some reason, just saying the society we live in and just like, it's like never ending. It's frustrating. It really, really is. Yeah. He's definitely the lazy twin. I am. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think either of you are lazy. <laughs> I'm rolling my eyes to this guy. <laughs> hey, it's that little brother thing where I have to throw those jabs, Rita. Yeah. I get yeah. I so I, I want to, I want to touch on just, uh, the whole thing with melanoma, I, I really am curious, just like, what was your initial reaction and thought, you know, when you got the diagnosis? So I was, di I was, I'm, I was getting a facial and cause we always, you know, women make sure they get their facials and their Botox, but going to the doctors for me is a struggle. Um, and when I was getting my facial, my um, esthetician saw like a, a mole, I, I'm very moly. Like I have a lot of, um, what are they called? Birth uh, moles, birth mm -hmm. moles. I call them beauty marks. That's what yes. I wanted to say. Yeah, beauty yeah. marks. It's not better than moles. <laughs> my, my family called me a chocolate chicky growing up. Like I just have <laughs> them everywhere. That was my nickname. So, and I would get them checked. And I had one removed when I was in grade six. I had one removed when I was in grade eight. And they all came back benign. So I was used to being like hole punch. They take literally like a hole punch. They punch a hole out of these things. It doesn't feel great. They send them off to a lab. They come back and they were benign, which means they're not cancerous. Fine. This was like my whole life. Um, and so she said, oh, I don't like the look of that. Make I would have never made it. I don't know why I was called. I called my doctor, called the dermatologist. She said, oh, that's fine. It's just ugly, but it's fine. But I don't like the look of this one. And so she saw one on my shoulder and one on my back, took the biopsy, send them off. I'm doing a spin class one day and I see like this number 10 times calling me. I jump off the bike and it was her. She's like, I have some bad news. The one on your back came back and it's actually stage two melanoma. I'm like, what? And I'm like, okay, it's fine. I'm like, I'm in my spin class. Can you just cut it out? And it's done. Like for me, it was cut out done. Like I, like I had done my whole life. And she's like, no, no, I don't think you understand the severity of this. Call me back when you're done. So I finished that spin class, like everything I do. And I was just like, oh, and then I, I ended the class and I just started bawling and all my friends were mm -hmm. like, well, I just, you know, I was just like, oh my God. And then, so I called her and she gave me more of a diagnosis and saying, you know, we have to remove lymph nodes. We have to go for a surgery. This could have spread this, you know, you have to go for radiation. Like, it was just like all these words at me, like melanoma is a bad form of cancer. And for somebody my age, the numbers were really bad. They were showing that of maybe an 80 year old person's type of numbers. Mm -hmm. So I went to see the surgeon and, and, you know, he, long story short, I, I crumbled, I fell to my knees, but then I just like looked up to God and I'm not, I was born Catholic. I was raised Catholic, very strict Italian family. We all had a piece in our church. Like I was the altar girl and my mom was the reader and my dad gave out the body of Christ but it was never like, it was just there. It wasn't like I ever had to call on God or fall to my knees, right? And so this really, 
I remember being like, God, like you're the only one right now who I'm putting my, I'm not putting my trust in the surgeons or science or medicine or anything. It's just you, like you need to, you need to man up right now. Right. Cause this is like not good. And so uh, I'm getting emotional. I don't like obviously talking about this, but, um, so I went for the big surgery. It was a year ago. It was December of 2019. And that was the hardest fall and winter of my, of my life. And the three weeks waiting for the pathology reports to come back to say if it had spread or not, because if this had spread to your lymph nodes, this is a really bad form of cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not like melanoma is really serious. So I was like, okay, what am I dealing with? And, and when everything came back clear, they took out six lymph nodes and everything came back clear. I remember I got it right before new year's Eve. And I was like, thank God, you know, thank God. But I was prepared to deal with it at the same time. So if, if, if it was radiation, I was like, okay. And I, and I remember talking to my family and having a big family um, communication, big talk. And it was like, okay, if this is that, we're going to get through this. Like, what haven't we gotten through? Like, what are we not going to get through? Don't worry about it. But I mean, I would lie in bed at night and cry and think about leaving two children without a mom. And that for yeah. me is the scariest thing in the world. Um, but here I am. I go for my checks every three months, even during this pandemic, my doctor's sees me under a blue light she checks all my moles and the percentages of it coming back is like five percent it's really really low so um i'm just happy that i got it when i did because i would have never looked you you don't have symptoms i didn't have any you know it doesn't come up it's scary and you know i and i'm i would tell people to be proactive with with their with their skin and and if you are somebody who has moles even if you just look at them yourself and look at them again and if they change just go go check them out it's it's a silent killer and a lot of people don't know how bad how bad melanoma is and mine uh, you know isn't it wasn't technically soul uh, sun i said soul Spanish just came out. It wasn't technically <laughs> sun exposure. Um, it can be genetics. And in my case, because I was born with them and I've had so many removed, it's genetics and having my son and the hormonal changes in my body could have made that worse. So it's not that I'm saying go sunbathe, but I, you know, I'm not going to stay out of the sun. I, I love the sun. I'm just yeah. very smart about it. Now I use sunscreen. I wear hats and all that jazz. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that, Rita. Like, honestly, like the courage to do that. And I know you got a little emotional. So, I mean, thank you so much. That's going to really touch a lot of the listeners. And this next question, I don't want to keep going, like, you know, getting you more emotional, but I have to ask this though, because it segues perfectly into it. If you had five years to live, what would you stop doing right now? I would stop. I would stop worrying about other people, other people's happiness in, in front of my own. And I don't mean by that my family. I mean people who the exterior world, right? I struggle with that all the time and words to make other people, you know, happy. That's part of who I am. Yeah. Um, and I only had five years to live. It would be a hundred percent, a little bit more ego driven in terms of what makes me happy. Yeah. That would be right. my answer. Yeah. <laughs> Final answer. That's a good one. <laughs> Final answer. I, I know that sounds, I know that sounds <laughs> egotistical, but it, and it doesn't mean that I wouldn't be there for others when they needed me. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's more like, okay. Um, a girlfriend wants a coffee date because they want to, I don't know, talk about gossip or they just want to have fun and my son's here and okay, I'm going to run and throw him with my mom or the babysitter just so I can be there for that friend. Cause I know it'll make that friend happy. I do that stuff. Like I do that a lot and I'm trying not to, right. I'm trying not to do things like that. And that doesn't mean I'm not there for people when they need me. It's just the frivolous things, you know, even though I may not want to do them, I do them because I yeah. want to make, I don't want to let, I don't want to let people down. Yeah, that's just who you are, yeah. you know, and um, I, I respect your answer. And that's why we asked this, uh, this question, because it's, it's powerful and everyone has a different uh, answer to it. And it's like, I, I respect the hell out of anyone that just says whatever they say to that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. So let's let's segue into something a little bit more fun here. So uh, Chris and I are really big on like people's lifestyles and their routines, like what makes them like you know uh, productive and just like overachievers, high performers. So uh, walk us through what a day in the life looks like for you. I set my alarm every day at 6 a.m. and I mm. press the snooze till seven. <laughs> I, <do. laughs> I love it. <laughs> you sound I like kind of. 
I try, I have great intentions and I'm in bed by 10. I'm not a like 10 is my time. I'm in bed. I get my eight hours. So that let's start with the night before I have to get my eight hours in or it's like, I'm not productive the next mm -hmm. day. Sometimes I'm up at six 30, but the whole problem right now with this pandemic and homeschooling and everything, your, your, your day's a little bit off. Cause you don't have to like rush the kids out and there's not school buses. And mm -hmm. I would have like the gym so I do this 930 class every day at like a, you guys have F45 over there, which is like, a, you know, like a, so I would, I would do the 930 class every day. So I had to make sure that, so I was out of bed then. So it depends if we're talking pre pandemic or during pandemic, but right now my day looks like 7am I'm out of bed. I make up a, a coffee every day, a bulletproof coffee. I'm an intermittent faster. So I just, I threw some coconut oil, blend it up with some, some coffee and I sit down at my computer. I light this candle every day that's beside me and I kind of just do some intentions and I, you know, I like, who can I serve today? God bring somebody into my life that is going to make a positive impact or a positive difference or, you know, what's, what's going on today. Kind of, I ask myself these questions. I also ask myself, like, I literally touch my body. I'm like, what do you feel like today? Do you feel like weights? Do you feel like cardio? Do you feel like walk? Do you feel like mm -hmm. yoga? Do you, like I ask, so I kind of set up my day like that, right? Like, what do you need? What do you want? And then my son wakes up and I have a routine with him, which is his bottle and his, you know, we, we have a few games. We have a whiteboard over here and we do some alphabets <laughs> and stuff like that. If my daughter needs me. She's, she's 14. She's pretty independent so she doesn't really need me and she doesn't really want me right now so that's not a uh, part of my routine and then you know I used to be a little bit more reactive where you wake up I take my phone off my phone goes on airplane mode at 7 p.m so I take it off around 8 a.m and I used to just answer all the questions but now I go through and I you know what do I need to do today so I need to do some writing for my book. Okay, set that aside. And I don't actually start writing till after my workout. The endorphins help me write, right? That's part of my routine. So I, I do the low hanging fruit with my coffee in the morning stuff that I don't need like so much inspiration and creativity. It might be, you know, following through with a couple of clients, easy emails, um, uh, maybe some social media content. Maybe it's a post on social media. Maybe it's a poll. Maybe it's answering some questions. It might even just be jotting a whole bunch of stuff down on a piece of paper. Like I need to do a newsletter this week and I need to reach out to this person and stuff like that. And then I go downstairs to our basement or I would have gone to the gym and I, and I do the workout that my body needs. And I spend a good hour to hour and a half down there, yeah. um, sweating it out, stretching, do what I never to do shower, do all that stuff, grab a shake. I always break my fast with a shake every day around 12 or 1230. And then I sit at the computer until four and that's dedicated time. Like, I don't think I could work more than four hours a day. So when you look at my like dedicated work of like creativity, thinking about the podcast, doing things, newsletters, client reach outs, um, writing programs for people, writing a chapter of the book that all happens between like 12 30 and 3 30 ish gotcha. right and then by between three and four before i get the kids and start that whole routine i have to move my body again but that's usually a walk like yesterday i went on an hour and a half walk or mm. you know it might be some stretching it might be dancing in the living room with music i have to move my body again and yeah. and get off the screen like no yeah. screen time um and then you know four to seven is like dinner prep and I'm still answering people. I'm doing Insta stories. I'm still like on, but with my family kind of in, uh, and then seven, it goes off and it's family time. And it's, you know, we do, we love games in this house. We play lots of games. We have dance parties. We're very like the four of us are like very interactive. So yeah, that's about it. Um, awesome. That's my typical. Yeah. Sundays I don't work. Uh, it's family. We did lunch with my parents, my typical Italian parents. We have homemade pasta every Sunday Love and I it. eat it. I eat it now and we play games and my dad's watching soccer in the background. And that's, I don't work at all unless, like I said, there's something super pending. And as an entrepreneur, if there's something to do, you need to do it. But that's the typical rule. Yeah. Yeah. We feel you on the Sundays. We don't work at all either. So whew. good. Hallelujah. Good. So I, I got to ask though, can you ship over some homemade Italian pasta over here to Dallas? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Sounds I'm sure. sure you can make that work. 
<laughs> well, Rita, we're coming to an end um, on this conversation, you know, and honestly, like, I just want to commend you first before I ask the last question and just say thank you so much for being an open book. Yeah. I mean, your courage, uh, you're a fighter, you know what I mean? Just um, dealing with the whole uh, thing that you went through and just everything that you're doing this past 14 years. And I, I feel like just getting to, like after getting to know you more after this conversation, like you're barely scratching the, the surface and you have like so much more to give and you're going to truly impact the world. So I truly commend you on that. And yeah, so and I, just, I want to say really quick, I'm very, I'm so happy that, you know, we were introduced to you by Chris Harder. Just, um, it's, it's, it's awesome. You know, I just really see just so much potential, just like more success going forward and it's all the impact. So cheers to, to more success, Thank Rita. Thank you. It means a lot. Yeah. So what does it mean to live a dynamic lifestyle to you? Ooh, I would say that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say being able to, being able to pivot, being light on your feet, being able to do what you want, how you want, with who you want. Um, yeah. Dynamic. Yeah, I think that would be it. Do, being able to do what you want, when you want, with who you want. Right? Like, I think, that's, that, I think that's the key. Like, if you wake up every day and you're doing what you want, your passion... You're not just working a job, but you wake up to do what you want to do and you get to choose the people with who you get to do it. And when you get to do it, that's a dynamic life. Like nobody can take that away from you. That's all in your hands and no pandemic, no president, no rules, no regulations can steal that shit from you. That's all you. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so we'll, we'll do like a, a virtual, like uh, knowledge bomb. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's true freedom. <laughs> that was good. I love it though. So Rita, um, is there anything we can support you on the listeners and then where can the listeners uh, connect with you? Yeah. Well, I just launched a podcast with my guy, Tommy Caldwell. We had a podcast this is truth be told. We had a podcast over a decade ago, just when we were both kind of scratching the surface and starting out, nobody was doing podcasts. Like now I feel like, you know, podcasts are like, who doesn't have a podcast? Yeah. And back then <laughs> we were the only ones kind of had one, especially in this area. And we loved it. And then he moved off and I, we separated we, we, and then the podcast just kind of left. And that was another silver lining of the pandemic. I hadn't talked to him in years and I reached out I'm like, Tommy, let's do a podcast. And I was just, I felt this collaboration again, right? Like this, this is my year of collaborating. I've been doing a lot of collaborating and uh, he's like, yeah, let's do it. And it just kind of came to fruition. So it's called beyond your body and it's meaningful conversations about health and wellness, particularly for women, but that could be on the superficial, what do you eat? How do you eat? How do I move? What dumbbells do I pick up? You know, we, we cover everything and there's really no topic off the, uh, off the table. So that's called Beyond Your Body with Rita Catalino and Tommy Caldwell. You can find it on Apple Podcast. You can find me on IG at Rita Catalino. You can find me at www.ritacatalino.com. It's really just my name. My name is just, you know, I wasn't very creative, obviously. Um, but it's just, you can just find Rita Catalino on all um, platforms and, and you'll find me. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's another Rita Catalino. It's not like Ben Smith. I think it's a pretty... Yeah. It's not like Eric Martinez. That's pretty, you know, I'm sure if you went to Mexico, you'd find more than one Eric Martinez. I know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what our mom was thinking. <laughs> and it's it's just, Eric Martinez. Yeah. And it's not just Rita Catalina. It's Rita Catalina. Catalino. 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 This guy. You got to throw that little twist to it. <laughs> it's funny. When I got married 19 years ago, by the way, I've been married for 19 years. When you asked about perseverance, I should have given just that story. Been married. <laughs> been married to a Spaniard for 19 years that's perseverance but um it, my husband's last name is Garcia which is like Smith in Canadian like yeah. it's Martinez yeah. Garcia and I was like I'm not gonna be Rita Garcia that's like I'm going from Catalino to Garcia it's not gonna <laughs> happen so I kept my last name and he's like I don't care you do what you want and, and it, he thinks and most Spaniards think it's really weird that women because in Spain, they don't take on their husband's last name. They keep their own last name, right? And it's funny because we're always being told that, you know, Latinos and Spanish people are so macho. But in my opinion, they have a lot more progressive rules around a lot of things than, than North Americans. So I'm going to leave you with that. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. I was going to say, because in the Hispanic, like more culture, it's like, it's looked at as kind of like disrespectful if the woman doesn't take the man's name, which is like, I'm not going to go oh. into that discussion. But oh, it's really? <laughs> okay. Well, in Spain, it's a lot different. You don't take your husband's last name. That's yeah. like, why? Why would you do that? Why would you yeah. change your identity? Yeah. yeah. Well, I like how you played it. So, you know, kudos to you for that. Thank you. Right on. So guys, we'll have all that linked up in the show notes. Please go follow Rita and see what she's up to. She's amazing. But um, other than that, thanks again, Rita, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Rita. Muchas gracias. Oh. De nada. <laughs> Until next time, guys. <laughs> All right, so wasn't that interview with Rita Cortellino super, super, what we call fire, the emojis, like the fire, like super good, right? Super knowledgeable. So hopefully you guys got some good nuggets and wisdom out of that. So what I want you to do now is I want you to watch this interview right here with Nick Tuminello. If you guys don't know who Nick Tuminello is and you're a fitness professional, you guys have been probably sleeping under a rock. Honestly, Nick Tuminello is a pioneer. He's a legend as a personal trainer. So we did an interview with him right here. Click over there and make sure to listen to that full entire interview. I promise we will not let you down on that, okay? So we'll see you in that, in that interview.